Wow. So thank you very much, John, for that kind introduction. And thank you all for coming on a Friday. It's a beautiful Friday, sunny afternoon, and yet you've come to the basement of this, of this marvellous building to hear me speak. So thank you very much for coming. Um, my aim is that it's a, it's a general talk. I know there's a wide range of people in the audience from age seven to somewhat older than seven, with all kinds of experience or otherwise of mathematics. Um, I will say, if at any point there's something you think, OK, that's too much for a Friday afternoon, I will never know if you just daydream for a couple of minutes. So, you know, I, I, you're, you're allowed to do that. But I'm hoping that we can all get something out of the evening um, by discussing, to begin with, um, some pretty pictures. So let's look at some pretty pictures. Here's a pretty picture. So this is a, a beautiful uh, interior of the dome of a mosque. It's, uh, it's in Iran. It dates back to about 1610. And... Just looking at that, I think, you know, anyone would agree that it's, it's a very nice thing to look at. It's, it's got some nice symmetry to it, some order to it, repeating patterns radiating out from the center. Without analyzing it too carefully, we, just, we can say, yes, you know, that, that is an appealing thing aesthetically. What I want to begin with by doing is just to show you a few things from sort of different cultures and different times to illustrate um, my view that a love of symmetry, of order, of pattern is, is something that's universal. It's not just one particular culture. It's not just a mathematician who might appreciate this kind of thing. There's beauty there to see for everybody. So here's, here's, here's a mosque in Iran. Um, this is the Book of Duro. So the, I feel sorry for the Book of Duro because everyone's heard of the Book of Kells. The Book of Duro <laughs> preceded the Book of Kells by a century. It's the, it's the oldest extant uh, illuminated Gospels from the British Isles, and, and you've got this beautiful uh, repeating patterns here of uh, so these are snakes sort of uh, interlocking with each other, and the pattern repeats along. And here in the centre, you've got this circular design that has a symmetry to it, so it's got a kind of sixfold symmetry. If perhaps you ignore the colours, there's a hexagonal uh, pattern around the inside these these circles. If you were to rotate it a sixth of the way round and put it back down, it would look the same. So it's got this symmetry of rotations that you can do and here we've got a repeating pattern that you could shift it along and put it back down it's still the same so that's another example of a the kind of thing we might want to look at when we're appreciating this sort of design um, this is another so these sort of pages decorative pages from uh, manuscripts like this are called carpet pages for obvious reasons um, this is one from a quran dating back to 1180 or so and here again we've got a uh, this is a circular design. It's all radiating out, radiating out from the centre of the circle. Here's an eight-fold kind of symmetry happening here. And then round the, round the border, you've got this frieze work kind of design with a repeating, interlocking, quite delicate design that repeats all the way around the edge. Um, so that's another thing. Okay, buildings. So this is famously a very beautiful building, the Taj Mahal. And... There's, there's clear symmetry here. You've got a, a vertical line um, you could draw down the middle, and there's a mirror symmetry, so left-right symmetry there. And when you look at that, it's just pleasing to the eye. Without, you know, it, it clearly is pleasing to the eye, and lots of buildings have this kind of symmetry. And what they've cleverly done here as well is, you might think with a symmetry um, with, with buildings, you're not going to be able to turn it upside down and have it look the same. So you couldn't ever hope for that kind of symmetry, sort of vertical uh, reflections but by putting this water the lake in the front you do actually get the effect of that so you've got not only a, a left right a vertical line of mirror uh, symmetry but you've also with the with the reflection of the water you've got a horizontal line of symmetry as well so you can get that effect um, the next picture you can't talk about beauty and art and things without uh, having a palladian villa um, and here is here is one and here Obviously, we can see there's a vertical symmetry, a line of symmetry with a left-right reflection. But if you were to look at this down from, from above, actually, it's, it's more symmetrical than that because there are four facades of this. This is one of them, but there's, so this is the north. There's also an east, west, and south. So it has this all the way around the square. It looks the same from, every, from every, each of the four angles. So that, there's more symmetry to this as well. Um, Okay, outside your building, maybe you have some lovely ornamental gardens. And here's some from the Chateau Villandry in France, uh, sort of Renaissance, not, not gardens, or ornamental gardens with all kinds of designs. Here we've got sort of coming out from the centre of a square and you've got this fourfold sort of symmetry, other kinds of symmetry happening over here. So, you know, throughout, throughout time, people have, people have made use of repeating or ordered patterns. Um, 
okay, you've got your building, you've got your gardens outside, then you have to decorate inside. So again, uh, it's, it's the law that you have to have the Alhambra Palace in any talk which involves symmetry or ma mathematics. And here is a wall in the Alhambra Palace. It's a Moorish palace in Spain. Um, and I guess a lot of times examples of this kind of design uh, it's drawn from Islamic art because of the restriction on depicting anything with a soul. So maybe you want to play it safe and depict geometric designs and figures. Here we've got um, around uh, some of these points. So here we've got a hexagon here, and then you've got three radiating arcs coming out from it. You can imagine if you rotated that um, a third of the way around, whatever that is, 120 degrees, you could put it back down and it's going to look the same. Or you could shift the whole design along, you could translate it along and and then put it back down again so you have a periodic repeating pattern. And these beautiful designs are all over the Alhambra Palace and it's, almost, it's a place of pilgrimage almost for mathematicians who like symmetry, which is all mathematicians. Um, <laughs> we, we want to visit, I haven't visited yet, I'm, I'm angling for a trip there in the, in the near future. We'll see if my children will agree to it. Um, so, so Escher actually, the artist MC Escher visited the Alhambra Palace on many occasions and, and took notes for, of, of all the symmetries he could find. So, okay, um, another example, here's a, here's a church window. This is Gothic, uh, Strasbourg Cathedral. And here there are actually, I counted 32 of these kind of spokes of the wheel radiating out from the center. So there's, again, there's, there's a symmetry from around the center point, sort of rotations you can do. And there's this five, five circles in the middle as well there. Um, so there's a lot going on in this picture. Um, bringing things up to date slightly, uh, so this is a church window-esque kind of picture, but this is uh, 2006, and this is a Damien Hirst butterfly picture. And I think it's slightly, I felt a bit <laughs> traduced by this picture because I saw it and thought it's really beautiful and it is beautiful, these lovely butterflies, and then you discover that it's real dead butterflies. <laughs> and maybe there's a bit of ambiguity there, and I suppose that's what he does, so you can like it or you can not like it, but, but I think just initially looking at it, there's a, there's a pleasing symmetry to it. Um, okay, you can even widen your scope. So people have designed towns and cities which have symmetrical designs. Um, and this is a, a Renaissance design for a sort of an ideal town. Um, and it's a very popular fad for designing these sort of towns, following on from Thomas More's Utopia, saying that you know, an ideal town would be sort of egalitarian, um, everyone has equal access to everything in the centre. It's like, I like the town square, I was calling this, but it's not, it's a town hexagon. A town hexagon is the centre of everything and everyone is equally near and all the resources are, so it's, it's some kind of, um, you know, a paradise of equality by having a symmetrical design. I think, well, yes, that's all very well. We, we live in the real world. Well, so do these guys, because they built it. And uh, <laughs> there it is. This is an aerial view of it today, Palma Nova in Italy. You can go and visit it. Um, so, yeah, so in, in all sorts of situations, we see symmetry, order, pattern, repeating patterns, freezes, mosaics, carpets, whatever you want. Um, so having decided that there is a lot of symmetry, um, we might say, why do we like symmetry? Now, there's, there's some views, and I'm not an expert in, in psychology of why we like symmetry, but I'll just very briefly elucidate a couple of uh, views. So the first is, it's literally easy on the eye, in that our eyes can process a repeating pattern, because you only need to look at a bit of it and then you know the rest is like it. So we don't like something like this. Can anyone spot, anyone spot the horrible disaster? Oh, it's not, no, imagine if, if you'd pay for someone to tile you. I, I wouldn't be able to cope with that. Um, <laughs> so there's that view and that's called the perceptual bias view that, that we like things because we can predict what's gonna happen. It's easier for us to remember. Um, another view is that you know, we are creatures of nature, and in nature there's a lot of symmetry. And um, there's sort of left-right symmetry in, in, in animals' faces, in humans' faces. Um, and even, you know, in, in, in the physical world, there's symmetry from a kind of subatomic level up to the level of the universe. Um, at this point, I, I thought it was a good time to tell the story of when I was younger, when I was a teenager. I went to a talk uh, with my sister by a physics professor, um, and uh, it got us annoyed because this guy... <laughs> very annoying um, he was saying all these things that were kind of dodgy like at one point there was a difficult concept and to illustrate that it was difficult wait for this he put up a picture of a woman in a hairdresser saying oh I don't understand so that was not good <laughs> already the hackles rising and then later on he put up a picture that he was illustrating the sun's rays reflecting from the earth's surface and to illustrate that he put up a picture of a topless woman sunbathing 
at this point, my sister and I were a bit annoyed. So at the end of the lecture, I was about 16, I stood up and said, excuse me, professor, I just wanted you to know that when I'm a professor, I'll be showing pictures of naked men in my lectures. So, <laughs> hey. <laughs> well, fairly tasteful, it's fairly tasteful, you know. Yeah. Hope you're not disappointed. Hope you're not disappointed. So this is, of course, this is a Vitruvian man. This illustrates that the proportion, symmetry and order and marvelousness of the human body. And, and we, have, we have a certain symmetry to us. And the, and the evolutionary... Uh, viewpoint of why we like symmetry is that it shows, you know, in a potential mate, it shows that they've got good genes and they, they're healthy and so on like this. So maybe that's why we like symmetry. Let's accept for the moment that we do like it and we want to think, okay, if we like symmetry and it's so great, can we sort of, is there some objective way of saying this thing is more symmetrical than that thing, whatever they are? Um, well, let's, let's start thinking about that. So measuring symmetry. Um, the symmetries of an object, what is a symmetry? Well, it's things you can do to that object that leave it looking the same. So if I've got a <coughs> rectangle, say, and I say, close your eyes, and you do so, and I quickly do that to it, when you open your eyes, um, it's still looking like a rectangle, it's still looking the same. So that's a symmetry, that whatever that is, a, a rotation through 180 degrees, a half turn, that's a symmetry. I could also, if I had some, some mirrors here, I could reflect it in a vertical line and I could get, it would still look the same afterwards. So that's a symmetry. Um, do something to an object, you leave it looking the same after you've done it. Um, if you're a mathematician, it's a distance preserving bijection. If you're not, it's something you can do to the shape that leaves it looking the same. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's have some examples of this. Um, I promised my daughter a triangle. Here is a triangle. So um, this is, is, it's got one short edge at the bottom and it's got two long edges that are equal isosceles triangle um, coming up to the point at the top. Now, what are the symmetries of this? What can we do to this that leave it looking the same? Well, there's a, there's a mirror line that we can draw, um, just vertical line. And if you put a mirror there and reflect it, put it back down again, it, it would look the same. So that, that's one symmetry, just a, a reflection that you can do. Um, I said there are two symmetries though. I've just, that's not a typo. There's something else you can do, and this is something you can do to any shape at all, no matter how strangely, you know, it's a splat of mud or whatever it is, um, do nothing. That's, that's a symmetry. You just, you know, pick it up, put it back down again. You haven't done anything at all. You've left all the points exactly where they were. That's not very interesting, but it is a symmetry. And it, it's true for any shape, you could do that too, no matter how strange it is. Um, so the other one is, so that's one reflection that you've got, and the other one is do nothing. And that's called the identity map, because I don't know, it leaves everything identically where it is. So any shape has this do nothing map, and this isosceles triangle also has one reflection that you can do. So two symmetries. Now, maybe you're thinking, okay, well, I like symmetry so much. I'd like a triangle that's even more symmetrical than that. How could I do that? Well, we're restricted in this, for this situation because whatever you do to your shape, I pick up my isosceles triangle, I twirl it around the room, I do whatever. This short edge that isn't the same length as any of the other edges, it's got to end up kind of back where it was because it can't, go to any other of the edges because they're longer and we're not allowed to stretch the triangle or do anything weird. So you're very restricted by the fact that this edge is the only one of that length, the only short one. If all the edges of the triangle were the same length, that gives us a bit more scope because then potentially we can move any edge to any other edge and that gives us more possibilities. And this is kind of true in general. So here's an equilateral triangle now, all the sides are the same. Um, now there's more we can do. There are three reflections you can do with this. Um, I'll draw you the three reflections. As vertical, you can chop it in half vertically, or northwest to southeast, or southwest to northeast. Um, so those three lines, each of them gives you a, a reflection, a line of symmetry. You could also, with this triangle, you can rotate it. So about the, the centre of the triangle, you can turn it a third of the way round, or a third of the way round the other direction, um, 120 degrees or 240 degrees, and both of those will still leave it looking the same to you pick it up, turn it, put it back down again. And there's always the do nothing map, the identity map. Um, so there's six now symmetries, so that's much better, better than two, right? So we can say the equilateral triangle is more symmetric objectively than the isosceles triangle, and a non-equilateral triangle. Um, and of course, you can, you can extend this idea. So polygons, right, what's a polygon? Well, it's a shape that you can draw with straight lines. Um, and if you pick one up and you put it down, it's supposed to be the same as it was at the beginning, then any edge, that you started off with an edge, when you put it down, it's still got to have to be an edge. And if all the edges are the same length, that gives you the most choice of where to put it back down again. It's 
essentially. And it's even better if all the angles between edges are the same, because that gives you the most possibilities for getting symmetries. So those shapes, those polygons where all the edges are the same length and all the angles between edges are the same, so if there's right, if one right angle, they're all right angles, that gives you the most choice. And those are called regular polygons, most symmetrical. Here are some. I drew for four and then I got tired of working up coordinates. Um, the equilateral triangle, a square, that's a regular uh, four gone, a regular pentagon, regular hexagon. And each of these have twice as many symmetries as they have edges. So the equilateral triangle had six, it's got three edges, it's got six symmetries, three reflections and two rotations and the identity and so on. And you get more and more symmetries as you go up. The most symmetrical kind of hexagon is a regular hexagon. Um, if you were to sort of carry on this process to infinity and keep adding more and more sides, then the sort of limiting process of that is a circle. And circles have an infinite number of symmetries. They're sort of perfectly symmetrical because you can cut them in half. Any diameter will give you a line of reflection. Um, and you can rotate through any angle about the centre and it'll still look the same. So circles are kind of the most symmetrical uh, shape that you could think of in two dimensions. Let's go up to three dimensions. Why not? Uh, in three dimensions, what sort of shapes might we look at? Well, polyhedra, and those are things, again, they're made with straight lines, they have edges, and, the, and the, the faces of them are, are polygons, okay? So we have things like a cube, for example. Now, you can work out the most symmetrical kinds of polyhedra, again, are going to be the ones where all the edges are the same length, all the angles are the same, um, the same number of faces around each vertex, that kind of thing. Um, and if you work out what does that mean, it doesn't take too long, ask me afterwards, um, there are five. There are only five of these things that are sort of the most symmetrical we could hope for. And those are called the platonic solids. Um, they've been known since antiquity. Let's have a picture of them. So um, it was not one of these pictures, but a different one from the same book that was on the kind of ad for this talk. Um, so I've put in the sphere too, because five things don't look very nice on a slide. Six things look better. Very symmetrical sphere. Um, so what have we got here? We've got icosahedron, octahedron, dodecahedron, tetrahedron and cube okay so that's that's the five platonic solids and these are from a book um came out in 1509 by uh, luca pacioli uh, in italy and he needed someone to do the illustrations for his book so he had this friend staying with him who had been teaching some maths too and he asked him to do the illustrations and that friend happened to be leonardo da vinci so if you're going to illustrate your maths book <laughs> you know that's a good person to pick <laughs> Um, so as a result, they're, they're very lovely drawings of these platonic solids. Um, and these are the most symmetrical of their kind. So the most symmetrical kind of cuboid is a cube, and it's got 48 symmetries. Um, the icosahedron here, 20 equilateral triangles stuck together, has 120 symmetries. My MSc students are just checking, yes, that's right. H3, yes, good. Right. <laughs> um, okay, so... Now I'm going to tell you about, we've got the art of group theory and the group theory of art, or one vice versa. It's sort of symmetrical title. I can't remember which one came first. Um, when we are finding symmetries, when we look for symmetries of a shape or of anything, a tessellation or whatever, um, we notice, or you're about to notice if you haven't already, that if you do a symmetry and then you do another one, the result is a third symmetry because maybe you rotate 90 degrees clockwise and then you rotate another 90 degrees clockwise. The net effect was 180 degrees clockwise. Um, that's another symmetry. So you combine two symmetries, you get a third symmetry. So you've got this property, it's called closure, that if, you, if you're in this, but if you've got symmetries and you combine them, you get more symmetries. And that's one of the properties of a group. So a group is just a, a bunch of things, and you combine them. You, when you combine the things in that set, you get other things in the set. So that's, that's one of the things that you need to be a group. So a group is a collection of things, maps, um, and I'll tell you what the, the rules are to be a group, just so you know. Um, so I, I'm claiming that if you take a shape, a triangle, whatever, you look at all its symmetries, the collection of all those symmetries is a group, and I'm telling you why. Um, here are the rules. The composition of any two thick maps, so, it, so a group is a set of maps um, from, from an object to itself, for example, the symmetries of a triangle, the composition of any two is another map in the group. So if you combine two symmetries, you get another symmetry. That's rule one, check. Next up, the identity map is in the group. So what's the identity? Don't do anything. Leave everything where it is. Yes, that's always a symmetry. Finally, this is something we haven't mentioned yet, every map is invertible. What does that mean? It means you can undo it. So take my clockwise 90 degree rotation. 
How do I undo that? Well, I just go the other direction, 90 degrees. I go back clockwise, 90 degrees anticlockwise. Um, now, that's all right, so we can undo it. We can always undo a symmetry. What about reflections? Reflections are interesting because if I'm going to reflect in a vertical line, so I've reflected, how do I undo that? Well, actually, I can just do it again. Right? If I reflect again in that line, I flip back to where I was. So reflections are very special because to undo them, you repeat them. Like they're their own inverse. So they undo themselves. They're almost the simplest thing you can think of apart from the identity, which is do nothing. That's too simple, actually. That's not interesting. <laughs> reflections are interesting because you, can, you do them and then you repeat them and you get back to where you started. So, that you, so their inverse is, is just them again. So you don't need any new symmetries. You've already got everything you need in that one symmetry. Another example is uh, rotation. So if I do 180 degree rotation and then I repeat it, I get back to where I started from. I will now do 180 degree rotation and then I will repeat it and get back to where I started from. And I'm back. <laughs> okay, so, so if you do a rotation half turn, that's another kind of one where it's its own inverse. Those type of maps are called involutions. We will say that word again later. Um, so that's a group. Now, if you're a mathematician, you might think, hang on, that's not the definition I saw in my textbook. But then, note to mathematicians, <laughs> close your eyes, non-mathematicians, this is equivalent to the standard definition because of Cayley's theorem. Cayley's theorem tells you that any group is isomorphic to a group of permutations, which is a map from a set to itself. So that's why, if anyone was worrying about it. Um, if anyone wasn't worrying and now he's worrying, don't worry about it. <laughs> So, examples then. Uh, symmetries, we've said they form a group. You can combine two symmetries to get another symmetry. Um, that's a group, but it's not just symmetries. The, the power of groups is that they occur everywhere. Um, here's an example. So, here are some cards. We are shuffling these cards. When we shuffle the cards, we rearrange them. We put the deck back down. You can't tell we've done anything. A rearrangement, a shuffling of, of a pack of cards is, um, is a thing you can do to that pack of cards. If you do a shuffle and another shuffle, you get a different kind of shuffle as an answer. So you can combine two shuffles by doing one, then the next one, and the answer is still a shuffle. Um, so the set of all possible shuffles on a deck of cards is a group. Um, or you can tweak it a bit. Um, shuffle and twist group, you shuffle your cards, and then some of them you can just rotate a bit. So if the back of, uh, of, of your cards, the design, does, isn't symmetrical, you turn them around, you might be able to tell the difference. And this is nice, but actually mathematicians have, I'm told, been employed by Las Vegas casinos to advise them on shuffling, card shuffling machines with their knowledge of how shuffles work and how the different uh, structures of these groups work. So these are groups. And of course, you have 52 cards in a normal deck. But if you're a mathematician, you have N cards, and then you get an infinite sequence of groups, naturally. Um, OK, shuffles, symmetries, numbers. Um, how can numbers be groups? I've said it's. These things are maps from a, a, an object to itself. Well, look at the number line. Um, so here it is, going off in all directions, well, both directions. Um, what, so three, what does that mean? It means go up three. One, two, three. What about minus numbers? Minus two, go down two. One, two. So now we can do some maths. We're going to work out two plus two. You ready? Start here. How are you combining these numbers? Two, one, two. Another two, one, two. That's four. So you've combined the two numbers, and we've got a different number, four. So by thinking of them in that way, we can, they form a group as well. The identity, what you do uh, that does nothing, you add zero. It doesn't have any effect. So numbers, shuffling, rearrangements, symmetries, all of these are groups. Now, when you start going, doing group theory, what you're doing is you're proving, you're finding out something about groups generally, and... If you, if you know that and you've worked it out about groups generally, then it's true about symmetries and shuffles and numbers and all sorts of other situations. So you can apply these, these things that you work out about groups, you can apply them in all these situations. And that's when you start doing group theory. So we're going to do some group theory because um, it lets us prove general results about lots of different situations. Um, so examples. Now, I used that word involution earlier. Now I've written it down for you. It's something that isn't the identity, isn't do nothing, but it's its own inverse. So think reflections, if you like. So to, to undo it, you do it again. That's what an involution is. Okay. You've got to prove something in a math talk, you see. It's, 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 a, it's another law. I follow the law. Um, here's a theorem. We're going to prove this theorem. Okay. What's a finite group? That's a group with a finite number of things in it. It's not infinite. So it might have 10 things in it. 10 symmetries or whatever. 
maybe this is the six symmetries of an equilateral triangle. Um, okay, if there are an even number of things in your group, so whatever they are, even number of maps, so maybe there's six or whatever, then one of those at least is going to be an involution. It's going to be one of these uh, things that's its own inverse, like a reflection set. That's a theorem, right? And this is true of any group with an even number of elements. So it could be a shuffling group, it could be a symmetry group, it could be a, a number group, it's finite. Always true, right? We're going to prove it. We're going to prove it. I'm best way to, I've got some writing, I don't think I'll bother with the writing. Um, so you get all the things in your group, you put them in a big bag, that's everything in the group. You've always got the identity element, that's one of the rules. And you may or may not have some involutions, whatever they are, put them there in there somewhere. And then you may or may not have some other stuff. The rule is you have to have an even number of elements for this to work. Okay, so say you've got 10 things in your bag. Right, you root around, you find something, let's call it X because we're mathematicians. Um, you find something, if you can, that is not the identity and it's not an involution. So what do we know about this element? We know it does not equal its own inverse. That's what we know about it. It doesn't, it doesn't undo itself. Maybe it's a, a rotation through 90 degrees and its inverse is a rotation in the other direction. So you find your X and you find its inverse, which is different from it. So there are two things here you've picked out of the bag, throw them away. So you had 10 things before, now you've got eight. You had an even number before, you've still got an even number because you've thrown two things away. Okay, they're gone, root around some more. If you can find anything else that doesn't equal its own inverse, say an element y, you find its inverse, which is not equal to y because it's not an involution, you throw those two things away. They're gone. You keep going until you can't do any more. What, how do you know you can't do any more when everything you have left is the identity or it's an involution? So at that point, what have you done? You've thrown away a load of pairs. You've thrown away two, 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 two from an even number. So you start with 10, maybe now you've got six or four. So you've got an even number of things left. One of them is the identity element. Throw it away. Now you've got an odd number. Maybe you've got three things now. And those things, there's nothing for it. They have to be involutions. We've thrown away everything that isn't an involution. We've thrown away the identity. All we've got left are involutions. Now, how many of them are there? We don't know, but it's an odd number. And zero is not an odd number. <laughs> zero is an even number. So that means you've got at least one involution. I've said that slower form with this writing. Um, through the identity, odd number of involutions. Zero is not an odd number. We know that. So there's got to be at least one involution. So if you are finding some symmetries and you think you've got eight of your shape, but you haven't got any reflections or things of uh, any involutions, something's gone wrong. So at least it could sort of a parity check where it can help you check whether you've missed anything out. But it, there, there are more applications than that, and you can generalize this a bit more as well. So this result, though, that we've proved about groups generally applies to symmetries, it applies to numbers, it applies to shuffles, it applies to all sorts of other situations that I haven't even mentioned. Okay, so that's the sort of thing you might do if you do group theory. Now, does this actually help us in if we're interested in art and decoration and things like this. Well, let's have a look at an example of not using that particular result, but using a uh, group theory kind of analysis. <coughs> freezes. So freezes, well, we know what they are, but you might find them in all sorts of situations. So I've got an example where there's, there's, a, there's a pot here and there's design, design going around the pot so it joins up with itself, so it kind of does go on forever, really. Um, here's one from a, a 13th century Italian church, just a bit of it. And in principle, they can go on forever in which direction. They're repeating patterns. So because of that, what are the symmetries we could have? We always have a translations, which means you can pick it up, move it, shift it along by one unit, and put it back down again, and it still looks the same. Um, so here, we could pick it up here and move the centre of this square, move it along one to the centre to, to this one, and put it back down, it's still going to look the same. So we can move it along, translations, those are called. This one has more symmetry than that because it's also got... Um, uh, a horizontal line of, of mirror symmetry, so you can flip it top to bottom. It's got some vertical lines of symmetry, so you can flip it like that. Here, um, here, where these two squares meet, and again, along here. So lots of these regularly repeating vertical uh, mirror lines. And we could even rotate it. So if we take, say, this point, we can rotate 180 degrees, and again, it's still going to look the same. So a lot of symmetry going on there. Um, there's one other kind of symmetry that isn't shown by this example. But on the next page, I wouldn't necessarily paint a freeze around my room that looked like this, but um, and you see a footprints, <laughs> look a bit dark. Um, so those footprints, you've got left, right, left, right footprints, just someone walking along. Um, the 
the symmetry is you could have this, you can't have like a, a vertical line of symmetry because it would change the direction of, of walking, change the direction of the feet. You can't rotate because again, it would change the direction. You can translate, um, left foot goes to left foot. But there's one other thing you can do. You can move kind of half the way along and then flip vertically. So the left foot turns into that right foot. So you're moving and reflecting at the same time. Move and reflect, move and reflect. That's called a glide reflection. That's a possibility as well for a freeze. Turns out those kind of those kind of symmetries are the only possibilities, and they're not, they can't all occur independently of each other. The reason being, some of them imply that others are there. Because of this property we've got of groups, if you combine two things in the group, you get another thing. So if you've got a vertical reflection and a horizontal reflection, the combination of those two things must also be a symmetry. And the combination of a vertical and a horizontal reflection is actually a rotation, it turns out. So if you have both the reflections, you have to have rotations. Um, because of this kind of argument, you can classify all the freeze groups. So in other words, if you go out, and I want you, this is your homework, when you go home tonight, as you're walking along, find a freeze and work out what, what of the seven, which, which kind of freeze it is. There are only seven kinds of group. Whatever freeze, infinitely many possible designs you could pick, only seven possible symmetry groups. And I've given you an example of each one there. Um, I'm not going to go through in detail. This one, all it has is the translations because it's got a kind of asymmetry to the, those waves that are cresting along. Um, this one, you'll see quite a lot of these around. You know, every building in Whitehall has this kind of vague and dark thing. Um, this one only has the vertical uh, lines of reflection. Um, but there, there are seven, so you can look this up. Um, Okay, well, that's freezes, so we now understand there's only seven kinds of freeze. That's one dimensional, really, going along in a line. What about, oh, music, just for really freezes. You can apply a lot of these arguments to, to music, because if you think about it, what is, what is a piece of music written down like this? It's just a, a line that carries on, and although it's not a perfect, perfectly, um, a perfect mapping, you can see, I think, here's a sort of glide reflection thing going along. It goes up. And then, you, so you move along half a bar and reflect, and it's going back in the direction. Reflect again, and reflect again, and reflect again. So glide reflections in this little piece. And there are many, many books written about maths and music, so I won't say any more there. All right, let's go into two dimensions, wallpaper patterns. As a Walthamstow resident, I always mention William Morris, because it's the marvellous William Morris Museum of Walthamstow, which you must visit. Um, this is his famous strawberry thief design. And you can see there's, there's lots of, it's a repeating design, um, and there's this vertical mirror lines, and you could translate it upwards or, or across. There's lots of symmetry happening there. Um, the wallpaper, possible symmetry groups of, of wallpaper were classified um, about a century ago. There are 17 of them. So seven freezes, 17 wallpaper patterns. Um, the Alhambra Palace, people differ about it. There's either 12 or 13 of them on show in the Alhambra Palace, so not bad for you know, the 12th century. Um, Here's his design by Escher, him again, um, with, with these beautiful birds flying in different directions. Um, again, you can analyse which, which group this is, and it's one of 17. So any, go home, look at your wallpaper, <laughs> if anyone has wallpaper anymore. And, um, and yeah, you can, you can work out which of the 17 groups uh, your wallpaper is in, or a tiled floor or a mosaic. Um, okay, briefly, I want to talk about, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you about all the papers I've ever written. Um, I want to briefly talk about some of the work I've done and I, with, with Peter Rowley, who's up in Manchester, and about involutions. So uh, his sort of idea of, of the kind of thing I'm not usually involving, I think they're griffins, are they? They've got wings, um, these creatures. This is a freeze. And it's, again, it's repeating. So it goes from vase. There's another vase bit there. That's, that's the repeating amount. Um, so there are translations, symmetries, and there are also vertical uh, mirror lines. So I've drawn in a couple of them, sort of adjacent ones for you there. So the red one through the middle of the vase, uh, the light blue one through the, the tails, the, where the tails meet. Um, now, interestingly, if you combine these two, two reflections, something interesting happens. So I'm going to show you what happens. Uh, so let's say R is the reflection in the red line and S is the reflection in the S cyan line. <laughs> Not quite. Um, here's an arrow just to show you what happens. Um, so do the reflection in the red line R it goes over to that orange arrow. Then we do the reflection in the line S, and it flips over again. And the net effect is that you've moved that line, that arrow, you've shifted it to the right, you've done a translation. So the composition of those two reflections is a translation. And it, if you were to repeat that, you'd get another tr translation through another unit, and so on and so on. 
you can get all the translations by just repeating these reflections. And in fact, I won't show it now, but any element, any element of this group can be made as a sequence of these, just these two reflections, which we will later call simple reflections. Um, just these two things can make every element in the whole group. And if you want to know how hard it is to make an element, well, it's just the number of these reflections you need to do to get to it. So that translation I just showed you, you need two. An expression with two things in it. So we say it has length two, right? So that's length is an important word. Think of these two letters, R and S, as letters of an alphabet, and you're writing words, and the words are the elements of the group. The translations have length two. So you can ask yourself questions. You can say, um, maybe I want to know how, how many elements are there of each length? So how does this work? You know, is there something of length 12? Is there something of length 11? Yes, there is. Um, what about involutions? We like those because they're kind of simple to understand. Maybe can we count the ones of each length or can we find, I don't know, the first, the first 10 easiest ones to make or something? And then the killer question, can we generalise this? This is what mathematicians like to do. We like to ask a question, answer it, and then try and make it much, much more general and answer it in lots of different situations. Hence, you know, group theory. So to do this for other groups, we need to meet this chap, um, HSM Coxeter, who obviously was called Donald. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, when he was born, it's Harold Scott MacDonald, right? There's the Donald right at the end. It was going to be Harold MacDonald Scott, but then that, that would have been HMS, and that sounds like a ship rather than person. So anyway, there he is, very long-lived, maths is good for you. He was 97 when he died. Um, and he's got a stellated icosahedron on his head, as, of course, many of us go to parties wearing. Um, he was working on groups. Uh, he was a geometer, and he, of course, used group theory to do his geometry because group theory is the best thing ever. Um, and he sort of invented a new kind of group, or classified a new kind of group called Coxeter groups. And these are ones where you can make everything in the group just from a small starting set of involutions. So think reflections or something. So our, our freeze example that we just had, that's a Coxeter group because everything can be made from these two reflections. And they're called simple reflections because everything else is made from them. So Coxeter groups, he didn't call them that, but they were called that. Now, after he wrote his paper on them, groups of this kind, then they immediately started being called Coxeter groups. Um, um, and it, so then you can have this idea of length because you've got a starting set of things that you're making everything else from. So you've got these letters you begin with, and then everything else is expressed in terms of those letters. So it's like words and you just count how many letters there are in that word, and that's the length of your thing. It gives you an idea of how complex your, your favourite rotation, whatever it is you're trying to make is, how difficult to express. Um, examples of Coxeter groups, right, symmetry groups, loads of symmetry groups. Symmetry groups of any regular polygon, of any polyhedra, um, polytopes, they're kind of higher dimensional analogues, we won't say any more about them. Um, symmetry groups of many of these tilings and the freezes, the one we just looked at, Coxeter groups. Um, the shuffling groups and the shuffle and twist groups that we mentioned with shuffling cards, they are coxeter groups as well. And um, the, the involutions you use there are flips where you flip two adjacent cards. Flip the first and second card over, flip them back again. You've undone it. So um, those are coxeter groups as well. And there, there are infinitely many of these things. Um, but just by adding this extra rule that you can make as a recipe for making everything out of just these small involutions at the beginning, Gives you a lot more power to analyse. There's Coxeter when he was young. Um, <laughs> it was his one when he was doing this particular stuff. Um, all the finite Coxeter groups have been classified, so we know exactly what they are. We can write down a list of, of what they all are. Um, and that, if you're a group theorist, you know that, that we are so, so far off. It's an impossible dream to be able to classify any finite groups. But the Coxeter groups, yes. And they all have these really nice geometrical interpretations as genuinely symmetry groups of objects. Um, Example, a shuffling group on four cards. You take four cards and look at all the shuffles. You can think of that, it's kind of the same group as the symmetry group of a tetrahedron. If you have three cards, but you're allowed to do that twisting as well as rearranging, that's like the symmetry group of a cube. And, oh, Sundays only, yes. When Coxter was young, um, he was getting so interested in geometry that he was neglecting his other schoolwork. I'm sorry to have to say, you should never neglect your other schoolwork, Millie. <laughs> <laughs> He was getting so interested in geometry, his teacher said, you're only allowed to think in four dimensions on Sundays. <laughs> so, if this was a Sunday, I could tell you that the shuffle and twist group on N cards is the same as the symmetry group of an N-dimensional hypercube, but I won't tell you that. Um, and actually, any Coxeter group, not just the finite ones, there's a really pretty geometric interpretation, um, but the geometry may not be Euclidean geometry, 
let's move swiftly on. Um, all right, so involutions are, are really good for coxed groups. They're the basic ingredients from which you can generate all the other things. You, this particular subset of the involutions are simple reflections, make everything else for you. So already they're important. Um, reflection, reflections, which we like, and they're easy to understand, they're involutions, they're an example. Um, also, it's a big theorem that any element of a finite coxed group is either an involution already, or you can make it just by uh, composing two involutions together. So you sort of feel if you understand something about involutions, then you understand quite a bit about what's going on in a Coxeter group. Um, and remember, the length of an element, so we want to find out about length, is the shortest way it can be written in terms of these, these simple involutions, these simple reflections that you started off with. OK, so what a very brief snapshot of some of the stuff I've done with, with Peter Rowley. Um, so what we've done is to try and study elements of the same type or the same class. So if you're a mathematician, I'm talking about conjugacy classes. If you're not, I might mean something like all the rotations, say, or all the reflections, or all the involutions together, something like that. And one way in which these things, which, which geometrically look quite similar, so if you're looking at all the translations, they're all sort of doing the same thing. One way you can tell them apart, perhaps, is by their length, by how easy or otherwise they are to write in terms of these little things you started off with. So we had two reflections at the beginning for our, for our Griffin-type freeze. Um, one, there was a translation you could write which had just used two reflections. There's another one that you can write that uses four and six and eight and so on. That's a way to differentiate these things. So they look similar geometrically, but maybe their lengths vary. So you can look at the whole bunch of them and write down <coughs> what all the lengths of them are and see what you can find out about that. Is that an interesting sequence? What does it tell you? And so on. Um, so here are some things we've found out over the years. So our first thing was, um, you give me your favourite Coxeter group, maybe it's the symmetries of an equilateral triangle, and you give me some involutions, some class of involutions, maybe all the involutions, and we can give you back all the smallest, the shortest ones in that collection, and we can give you the, the longest ones, the hardest ones to get, the most complex ones, if there are such. And there will be in a finite case, in the infinite case, maybe there aren't. Maybe they get longer and longer and longer, and there's no longest one. And we can tell you how many there are of, of each. Um, so there we've got a sort of a smallest and a biggest. So that was the fir our first foray into this. Um, next thing we say, OK, well, we've got a smallest and a biggest. Could it ever happen that actually the smallest and the biggest are the same thing? So in other words, everything is the same length. Everything is the equally difficult or easy to write down. Could that happen? It's, it's unusual, but it can happen. So we classified all the cases where that can happen. Happily, there weren't very many. We worked out what, what they all were, and we, we classified all of those. Those are called flat classes for those reasons. Um, then, if you go to an infinite Cox group, so we've seen one of these. That freeze group had infinitely many translations. You could do an infinitely many reflections. Um, in a group like that, um, we showed that actually, if you take a class of things, either everything has the same length, so it's flat, or you can get arbitrarily large. So there's arbitrarily complex things going up. You can find things, any number you like, I can find you something longer than that. It takes more and it reflections to make. Um, and then this year, in the last year, we've been working on, on distributions. So I've said we, we knew um, a few years ago what the smallest and the biggest thing were. And well, then we thought, well, can we actually fill in the gaps? Can we tell you what all the numbers are in between? So maybe there's one smallest one and one biggest one, but what's happening in between? How many are there of each level? And so we've been trying to work on that. And for Finite Cox groups, we've got an answer for involutions. So for a class of involutions, we, we, we've got formulae that can tell you exactly how many involutions there are of each given length. And there are there have been conjectures about this, and we've managed to sort of sort out a couple of these conjectures. Um, so that's just a small snapshot. It's about 10 papers worth of stuff in there. If you'd like to read any of these papers, please, please, you're very welcome to email me, and I will, I will send you whichever ones you like to read, but not at this point on a Friday night. Um, so what, what are you thinking by this stage? <laughs> Why? Why are you doing this? Why bother with this? Well, you know, OK. It helps us to understand the structure of these groups. If, you, if, you, if you're interested in them, you want to understand them, you want to know how, uh, you know, how complex the elements are, how, how difficult it is to express them in, in these terms. So that's why we might study length. Um, the formulas you get out for these distributions actually themselves are often symmetrical. So it's sort of symmetry leading to more symmetry, which is always nice. But really, the, the honest answer is, I, I'll give a quote from Coxeter himself. He said, no one asks artists why they do what they do. Unlike any artist, it's just that the obsession that fills my mind is shapes and patterns. 
So we can't help ourselves, basically. Keep us off the streets, make us happy. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's all right. We, we just like doing it because it's there, you know. It's just interesting to us. Um, can we go the other direction then? So as a final sort of finishing thing, we, we started with art, we got to symmetry, we got to mathematics, we did some stuff. Does it ever go the other direction? Does mathematics ever lead to interesting or new art? So that's the question. I think it does, and it can do, and there's sort of three ways in which it can do this, um, at least. So first of all, the quite simply representations of geometric figures. So we've seen the, the lovely Leonardo pictures of, of polyhedra. Um, another example, so, so Dura uh, etchings, this famous one, melancholia. So there's lots of maths going on here. There's a magic square here. There's a sphere down here. There's this truncated rhombohedron. I'm sure you recognised it as that. Um, I could see, well, yes, it's truncated, yes. Um, also known as Dura's solid, which is easier to remember. Um, so, you know, these representations of, of, of geometric objects um, is sort of slightly more up to date. So this is, these are some pretty sculptures by the New Zealand artist John Robinson. Now, one of them is called Intuition and one of them is called Immortality. Uh, I think that's intuition, <laughs> yes, immortality. Um, they, you know, they're, they're, they're beautiful objects um, in themselves. So the sort of representation of, of mathematical objects. The second thing is the search for new designs. Now, I haven't put down, but you could have, for example, in architecture, your Buckminster Fuller geodesic domes or the, the roof of the Great Court of the British Library. These are using mathematical designs to produce interesting new architecture. Um, so there's that. There's also... This kind of thing. So what's this? This is a, it's a picture, it's a diagram from a book by Coxeter. And um, it doesn't matter too much what, you know, it, it's, it's representing hyperbolic geometry, whatever that is. And um, the idea is that this is sort of representing um, in infinite, an infinite object and getting towards the edge of the disc, the shapes aren't really getting smaller, they're getting closer to infinity. So the edge of this disc is infinity. So this is a way of representing an infinite thing in a finite bounded space. And that's exactly what Escher was trying to do with his tessellations, which suggested infinity, because he could continue them forever. Um, and he was looking for ways of actually representing infinity, right? And he was reading this book by Coxeter. And when he saw this diagram, aha, now, see if you can detect any similarity between this diagram and the picture Circle Limit 1 by Escher. I'm going to put just see if you, subtle, see if you can spot it. <laughs> It's quite similar, right? He saw this picture and he went immediately, right, I can do this. So he added some eyes in, you know, basically Coxeter did this picture, you know, really. Um, Escher wrote to Coxeter and said, this is great, you know, this has solved this problem of mine. Is there any other way of doing this? Can we do it? And Coxeter was very excited. Yes, there's infinitely many ways. He wrote back a long letter and actually they corresponded over, over many years. Um, and Escher drew many more pictures of this kind, here's another one. What I love about this is that when he was doing this, he'd go off to his study and he would say, I'm going to do some Coxetering. And I think this must be the only time when a mathematician's name has been verbed in the course of art. So if you know of another example, please let me know. So there's that, right? Finally, the symbolism of symmetry. Um, now, what I mean by this is there's sort of a, a mystical belief over time that, you know, the universe is ordered and symmetrical, and you have the music of the spheres, and you have Kepler saying that the orbits of the planets um, can, be, can be found by nesting the platonic solids one inside another. This only worked when there were six planets known, unfortunately, it doesn't work so well now. Um, but, but using symmetry and knowing the rules of symmetry allows you to be a bit cheeky. So I want to finish with this picture, which is uh, the Baron Shelley Polyptych, which is uh, by, either by Giotto or by School of Giotto, you know, not absolutely certain. So this is the coronation of, of Mary. And on the left, you've got 51 saints and 10 angels all gazing adoringly up to, to this great ceremony. On the right, you've got 51 saints, 10 angels, all gazing adoringly up at the ceremony. Um, everyone's looking and the, and the symmetry is being used to draw the eye to the center and to this important thing that's happening. It's all very beautiful. And then you notice, have a look over here. Um, I'm gonna just enlarge this bit. There's a guy who's looking the wrong way. <laughs> Why is he doing that? Now, my view, it's not an accident, right? You know, this is an expensively done picture. This is not, oops, I've painted him point. Never mind, no one will have noticed. This means something. This, and I, I, this is a mystery, okay? We can discuss this over a drink afterwards. I don't know why this is done, but I know it's done for a reason, right? This is deliberate symmetry breaking for some reason. Maybe it's a joke, maybe it's an in-joke, maybe it's whatever it is. But 
my view is that if you're going to do this, if you're going to play with symmetry, before you can do that, you've got to understand the rules. You've got to understand symmetry in order to break symmetry. So I'll finish on that mystery and we can talk about it afterwards. Thank you for listening. Wonderful, thank you. It's, it's always a pleasure to host these events and to recognise colleagues for their achievements, particularly when they are the first in their area in the college, as Sarah is, for uh, mathematics, and that's wonderful. And it's also so good to reward colleagues who do not have the identity map gene, i.e. do nothing, leave everything where it is. <laughs> so there is a certain symmetry there as well, isn't there? Uh, it's a shame in the UK, I think, that so many children are put off maths at an early stage in, in their primary school careers. But then Birkbeck has been here for 191 years, rectifying that by giving people the, the, another opportunity to discover art and maths and beauty and symmetry and all those sorts of things. So that's why we're here and long may it continue. So we have a reception to go to but uh, in the foyer, but first please join with me in formally thanking Professor Hart for her lecture and in congratulating her on gaining her chair in mathematics. Thank you.